Mm -hmm. Yes. How's that look? There we go. So I'm going to go through a lot of information today, and then we'll have a question and answer at, at the end. I'd like to give give you as much knowledge about uh, a lot of the work that I do in, in, in leasing so that uh, you understand all the issues. I have clients that come to me on, on a regular basis that say, hey, I have this contract. Mind if I bring it over so you can take a look at it? And um, the answer is, you know what? It's not that simple. Uh, there is a lot of time and effort that goes into these contracts. I haven't met one that I liked to start. Um, and uh, we are always doing a, a quite a bit of work. I'd say that you know, these are typically 30 to 40 page contracts and it's not uncommon for us to, to spend a good five or six hours in the first pass of uh, reading it, understanding it and making revisions to, to those contracts. I often tell people, you know, it's, it's one thing to um, understand the written language that's in it and uh, we can all read and understand it. But what you don't know is what's not in it because in the industry, there are many things that are out there that are going on maybe opportunities for you to increase the, uh, the revenue that you're, you're getting on the project uh, that might not be there, that, that you really should be looking at. So let's just kind of quickly give, give an idea of why we're here, right? Um, right now, we're trying everything we can to decrease our, our greenhouse gases. And uh, our state energy plan in 2019, it was amended. So 70% of all electricity used in New York State by 2030 in nine years should be generated from renewable energy sources. And if you look at the picture of where we are right now, you see, unfortunately, that solar is down at 1%. Wind is only 3%, right? And when we talk about developing our renewable energy projects, we're mostly talking about wind and solar. So we really have a long ways to go. The thing that helps us in New York, where we're really way ahead of some other states, is hydroelectric. See that that's that 22% figure. But uh, we have to, in order for us to get up to 70%, we need to have a lot of development. Here's something we're, we're lucky. We've got, I think, 180 hydroelectric plants in New York. And uh, that's great clean energy. But we want more clean energy coming to us with wind and solar. We know we've got nuclear that's out there, but the Indian Point Power Plant has now closed after 59 years of operations. It was producing 2,000 megawatts of energy. And that, that's when units two and unit three were operational. So 2000 megawatts, understand kind of the magnitude of what we're talking about, because right now, if you take a look at all of the wind projects in the entire state, how much energy does that produce? About 2000 megawatts, right? So um, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of developing our renewable energy in order to get to where we need to be, to get to that 70% goal. Now we have to replace uh, what's happened with the, uh, the closing of the Ind Indian Point, and we needed to, to bring in a lot, uh, a lot more renewable energy projects. Of course, they do take up a lot of land, right? The wind project that I worked on recently was taking, on 6, 000, taking up 6,000 acres of land. Typically, you know, depending upon the type of project, we're talking about maybe a 20-acre project, 40 acres, 100 or more. I'm working on a 900-acre project right now in, in upstate New York. Um, so there is a lot of land use to develop. Uh, Lauren mentioned community solar, you know, generally consumers who want to obtain their power from solar energy, but can install an array on their home. Uh, so developers will go out and build a five megawatt community solar farm that often take 20 to 40 acres. They often also kind of put them back to back. So we see a lot that are, are two community solar farms of, of 10 megawatts. Um, and that's where you know, the three phase distribution line is what they're looking for. We, we really want to have that point of interconnection that's close to the solar farm, right? We don't want to build lines that are two miles away because the cost of that is just too great. If it's less than a mile, that might be manageable depending upon um, the economics of, of the project. And then here's kind of an example of one uh, community solar farm in Trumansburg, right? Utility scale solar projects are larger projects, typically more than 40, often hundred acres. I am, I am frequently, leasing 100 an acre more projects uh, throughout the state. Um, they're gonna produce 10 megawatts and more. We see some that are 25 megawatts and more. Um, usually these are gonna be connected to substations. Um, I think I have some people that will come to me and say, you know, I, I've got land, um, I wanna be able to lease the land. And by the way, I have a, a high power line that goes right over my property. So I should be in good shape. 
That might be true, but not necessarily, because on a utility scale project and, and community solar projects, you can't just go straight up and connect to that high power transmission line. You need to find that point of interconnection. I've got uh, a client right now whose property has a transmission line, a high power transmission line over it. It's about 125 acre property, but the point of interconnection is about a, a mile and a half. The developer is really hoping to, to, to string other properties together in order to get there. But if they can't do it, then, then the developer is gonna have a hard time uh, developing that project for that property. Here's uh, kind of an example of one of the bigger ones. This is one that's out uh, in a local school that is near my house. This is the beginning development stages. What's interesting about them, I live probably four miles away from, from this school. And um, I could hear every pillar going into the ground when, when this was being developed. Um, they did not set anything in concrete. They just drove each one of these pillars into the ground and I could just hear the, the constant pounding. But it really did not take too long to, to get this one developed. You'll see here some of the stages, right? Um, Lauren talked a little bit about the conversion from DC to AC, right? That's the inverter box that, that does that. Um, there's uh, what it looked like when it's done. See this green covering on the fence. Um, I like that kind of green covering. I'll talk a little bit more about these trees with, with some visual barrier. Remember those trees are gonna grow and, and I think are going to, to be, be that visual barrier into the future. And there's the school, right? That's where my kids went to school right there at Maine Memorial. Uh, so you'll see that uh, they've been talking about this project for a long time and it's been a great educational tool mm -hmm. for the teachers to talk about um, solar and wind and, and um, reduce, reducing our greenhouse impacts. Um, that one is four point megawatts. It's uh, built on probably a little bit more than 15 acres and is now producing energy for the school. Um, so for marketable properties, when, what do we need to have? We need to have easy interconnection. We need to have a substation nearby or a three phase line. Preferably, we like to have properties that are flat or that slope to the south. Um, you know, there are a lot of trees that, that get cut in these projects. So just because it's wooded doesn't mean that you're not available for, for a solar farm. They're taking a lot of trees down. Um, wetlands, ponds, streams, they can really be serious issues. So if it turns out that, that they're there, they might be impediments to developing or they may just develop or be, be able to develop around them. And uh, there needs to be good access too because there's a, this is a big construction project. So they need to be able to access the property with roads. Um, Lauren mentioned a little bit about capacity issues, and, and this is um, this is a big deal right now. So, again, having this substation or transmission line does not necessarily mean that there's going to be capacity in those lines to to move forward with the project. Um, the electrical equipment associated with the interconnection might need to be upgraded. So, an interconnection study is is definitely necessary um, before. The, the developer signs a lease. And keep in mind, right, we're talking oftentimes about an option agreement where we, we the developer signs an option. The option is to sign the lease later on if everything happens correctly. So they'll go through the option, do their studies, and if everything works out the way that they need to, then they move to the lease stage. But that interconnection study is going to be necessary. I, having uh, clients these days uh, running into some of these issues. I've got one right now where there's two developers that are already in, a, in the queue ahead of my client. Uh, they were there well ahead of uh, the, the lease that we signed. And uh, the developers talking to that other developer, trying to figure out if they intend this to actually complete their construction or not. If, um, if they remove their project, then we'll be able to go ahead. If not, NYSEC has said that the um, interconnection costs are going to be pretty high. And, and again, that might be an impediment for our project moving forward. Um, the New York State Independent System Operator a couple of years ago said that this is going to be one of the issues that we have to contend with. We, they predicted that we would need a thousand miles of new transmission lines in New York State in order to achieve the, the state's clean energy standard. Now, what happens when we develop new transmission lines in the state? Not everyone likes that, do they? because then we find that uh, there's, there's some opposition to, to some of those transmission lines. Some of the things that are being talked about right now in Washington are how are we going to fund these, these new transmission lines through some of the infrastructure acts. So there are funds in there to try to do that in order to move us along closer to our renewable energy goals. 
So when a landowner comes in to me to, to talk about signing a lease, the first question that I have for them is, are, are you prepared to lose the use of your land for, for many of us the rest of our lives? I mean, I, I look at these as generational projects. These leases tend to be 35 to 40 years long. Um, when you get to that point, if it's a successful project, I'm sure that the company is going to want to continue that, that, that project and extend. So are you prepared to, to lose the use of that land? I think you have to decide whether, whether you're at that point or not. Um, then the companies will start with a couple of different things, right? I have some companies that come in and say, well, we don't really want to get into the big lease uh, process. Let's just sign a letter of intent or let's just sign an option agreement with no lease and then we'll do our studies. And then if all that works out, then we'll come back and start negotiating the lease. I will tell you that generally I do not like that approach. And, and the reason I don't like it is that what happens when I go down the road with the developer for a year or two years or three years, and now they find that they've got everything together that they need. And we're now at the point where I'm negotiating the lease. I don't want to get surprised by finding out that when we're negotiating the lease, they don't, for instance, want to do a rest restoration bond because they think that that's going to be too expensive. I want to know those things right now because those are the decisions that I may be making about whether I really want to do business with, with this developer. But I'll tell you that pressure is, is going on constantly. The developers want, to sign, want you to sign that letter of intent so they have land control and they can go to the utility and start getting into that queue. Um, if I do one, and sometimes I do, um, it's it's going to be short term, and it's going to sometimes. Uh, I just did an option with no lease, right? I haven't done one in a while, but I did it here. But I essentially put all the important terms in the lease that I would want to have into the option agreement, and we'll talk about what some of those those provisions are. So. But we didn't have a lease, but but we have some basic understanding that this these are the things that we're going to want to have into the future. The other thing that I'm running into with letters of intent is that even though they say they're non-binding, I still have developers using them against me. Right? I'll have landowners going out signing these letters of intent without talking to an attorney. Right? They didn't didn't fully understand understand the issues, but there are key things that they agreed to in the letter of intent that, while the, the letter of intent says it's non-binding. The company in their mind thinks you've committed. And one of those key issues might be rent, right? Landowners who are signing rent that's just rent that's just far too low. I have one that signed a, a, a lease for $700 an acre. Well, that's not what the, the going rates are. Um, in their mind, they're thinking, right? That was just a letter of intent, it's non binding. But in the company mind, that was one of the terms that the company felt that the landowner committed to. And um, you know, they pushed hard on, on that issue. So those are those are some of the things that we're, we're dealing with on, uh, on letters of intent. So let's talk about the, the, the lease process. Again, I mentioned that we start with an option agreement, right? And in the option agreement, if all those things work out the way that they should, then the company exercises the option and signs the lease. That's usually the format. There's some variations on that. And sometimes it's all contained in the lease, but that's the concept. And in the option, right, we have the term where we're looking at inspections, they're doing utility studies, they're looking at municipal approvals. Um, and if all those things check out, then they'll go ahead and get into the lease stage where they start constructing. They just get into the operations term. The operations term is, is where now you're actually operating and, and generating power to put into the grid. And that's oftentimes the, the also the point where the rent payments are triggered. And then there's decommissioning. When the whole project is done and the lease has terminated, their obligation to decommission and restore the land. So in your option, right? This is where we're gonna start talking about um, dollars and cents. And um, you know, oftentimes we'll have option payments and they really vary across the board depending upon the company and, and sometimes depending upon the marketability of your property. So um, if you're going to sign an option agreement, there should be a payment to you up front. And there should also be a payment to you in some, some sort of periodic terms. Maybe it's six months, maybe it's every year. Most of them I see are probably every year, where for every year during that option, they are making a payment. You really don't want that to be unlimited because if, they're not, if they don't have to make a payment to you, 
and they have you locked up in the option, there's no incentive for them to terminate the option. And that unterminated option means that your property is locked up and you can't do anything else. The options and the lease lease agreements, they are terminable by the companies, but they are not terminable by you, you know, unless there's some sort of default along the way. But you can't decide that you that you just don't want to do this anymore. You're out. So once you get into this option, you're, you are committing to the transaction. I'm always asking for reimbursement and attorney's fees. Um, I can oftentimes get a thousand, two thousand. I have one developer that regularly gives three thousand um, dollars. You know, in order to do this the right way, this is a really a, a major piece of development that, that takes quite a bit of work. So you're gonna you're gonna spend a few, a few thousand dollars on legal fees. I also like to have a minimum acre commitment. Right, I have 100 acres that I'm trying to lease. And that's what I expect when I'm calculating my, my rent of maybe $1,200 an acre times my 100 acres. That's, that's what I'm in this for. I don't wanna find out later on when the developer says we're ready to go, we have our approvals, that we're only gonna use 10 acres of your property. And it turns out most of our project is gonna be on, on other properties that, that adjoin yours. Right? I like to have a minimum acre commitment so that I know that they, they, they're gonna be committed to at least leasing a certain amount of my property. Um, the locations of everything are really key. You have to understand that every single one of these leases come in the same way, right? They say, you are leasing the entire property, right? Now, it might be that you're only leasing 40 acres of your 100 acre property, but the entire 100 acres generally goes into the lease, right? So where is that 40 acres, right? It's nice to be able to talk about it up front and see where that site plan is, but what does the language in the lease actually say? I will tell you, most of these leases say they can put it wherever they want to put it, right? And not just the solar panels, but we have to factor in transmission lines. And we have to factor in the access roads. And I almost never see those from the developers up front. But the language in these leases say that they've got the power to put them anywhere on the property that they want. You have to change that. You have to change that so that you have a say in where these facilities are being developed on your property. Now, the flip side of it is that the companies always push back, right? They don't want to be in a position where they've spent maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars and then find out that you're rejecting every single location on the property. So you have to be reasonable about it. And there's language that we use to address that, but you have to have a say in, in where the project is going to go. Or you just decide straight up front, this is the location, right? There's no, there's no variations in it. This particular location is where it's going to go. And if it doesn't go there, then you got to come back to me. Um, on the option terms, right, again, they try to give themselves as many years as possible. I just had an option cross my desk for six years. So for six years, they want the ability to, to study your, your property to decide whether you're going to get into a lease. But you don't want to wait that long. So you really want to minimize that option period for as long as possible. They may have a, an, a, an honest intention, intention to develop your property. But if, I, if they have two leases, one with a three-year option and another with a six-year option, which one are they going to develop first? Well, you're going to be put on the shelf for a while because they have more time under your agreement. So try to minimize that, that option. Um, also, during these option periods, they're going to be on your land. So what happens when they're on there? Right? They're making maybe bore, they're boring soil for, for environmental tests. They're bringing equipment on the property. If there's any damages on the property, they need to uh, to repair it. They need to tell you right when the when they're out there inspecting. Right, you don't want to look out your kitchen window and find that there's people and four wheelers driving around your property and you didn't know that they were coming. So there should be some notice of those inspections. And then also keep in mind you're tied up for this period of time in this option. You're committed to this transaction, but what are you reserving to yourself? Right, my leases try to say we're reserving all legal rights except anything that is going to interfere with, with the development of a solar farm. So if I need to, to take trees down, I have the right to do that. I can do it anywhere. If I want to develop my rock and gravel, I can do that. Oil and gas, we're, we're still reserving oil and gas rates um, in all of our leases. Whether that ever comes together in New York, who knows, but I, I like to keep the properties as marketable as possible and reserving those oil and gas rates are, are, are something that I think people should be doing. Hunting. Right? If you've got specific needs about hunting and you want to make sure that those are addressed, then, then we're doing that too. 
again, we're just in the option, right? So this is the period where they're just looking at your property to decide if they're gonna go into the lease. If one of their workers is on the property and gets hurt, right? And there's a lawsuit o over the, his, his or her injuries, then you wanna make sure that you're covered. You're covering yourself with, with insurance that the company is buying for you and an indemnification clause where they're covering you for, for any damages and attorney fees that you might incur. Also, the right to transfer your property is key, right? None of us knows what's gonna happen over the next three years, you know, over the next day, the next week. So we wanna make sure that we're not locked up and, um, and even to mortgage the property, right? If I, if I need to have a buyer come in and purchase the property, but there's a provision in the option that says that there can be no liens that are superior to the, to the option, well then my buyer might have trouble getting a mortgage. I don't want that to happen. I address that both in the option and I address this in the lease. This is a big issue because most lenders in, in our state wanna be first. You can negotiate these provisions with these, with these companies that say that they'll give up their first position as long as there's a non-disturbance agreement in place. And the non-disturbance agreement simply says, there's a problem with the, the first lien on the, on, the, uh, on the loan. And the lender agrees that whatever they do to the property, if it ends up being a foreclosure, that they won't disturb the solar farm or that agreement. And those will typically work in, in these transactions. And then lastly, and, and I give this advice to all my clients, don't give up your day job, right? I mean, you know, Lauren was kind of talking about this process and, and what goes into it and, and the time and the many different things that happen. This is like a big puzzle, right? And they've got to put together the pieces that, of that puzzle in order to bring the project together. If one piece does not fit, then that project might not get developed. So um, there's quite a bit to do. They've got to get past the municipal approvals. It's great if your neighbors are supportive. I can tell you that does not always happen, um, but um, you've got to at least see how this thing plays out um, before you start, uh, before you start uh, making other plans. So let's talk about the least area, right? We spent a lot of time with clients just figuring out how is this going to be situated on our property? What's, what's the site plan, right? We'll get to the lease terms and some of those are similar to the option terms, but what are you going to do on my property? So this is an example of what a solar developer sent to my client. Right? This is what we're gonna do. The area around the uh, property in yellow, those are the property boundaries and the green is where they plan to develop. But it was one of these leases that said, hey, we can really do whatever we wanna do and, and move wherever we need to go. So um, all of those green areas could change. The other thing that this site plan is missing is, is transmission lines and um, an access road. Where are they going to go? So here's an example of one that's a little bit, got a little bit more detail to it, right? Now this is 29.6 acres uh, where the solar farm is estimated to go, right? This POI, that's the point of inter interconnection. So this was really a very valuable property because they could connect right at the corner of the property at the road. Um, and then access to the property was nice and easy, right? Just go from the road and get, and get right into the solar farm. Um, so they can get to wherever they need to. And, uh, and they do need to go there. They're gonna need to, to maintain it from time to time to mow, uh, replace panels, things like that. The one thing that concerned me about this particular site plan though, was what about all the rest of this property back here, right? And what's my access here? Because it looks like on this side, right? I'm shut off and I don't have too much room on this. So you wanna make sure that when you're putting these site plans together, they're not putting them together in a way that landlocks other property or frankly, just makes it difficult to use. Make sure that your access rights are, are protected. Here's another one that we put together where the developer wasn't exactly sure where they were gonna put everything. And so what we did is we said, okay, we're gonna give you the areas where we will allow you to develop, but then what we're gonna do is we're gonna mark off other areas where you can't. So you see these boxes that have the X's in them are excluded from development. They cannot develop in these areas. And those are areas that the client really wanted to preserve. Um, the area in the red is the area where the development is allowed. So we had a minimum acres provision over this portion of the acres. And then um, 
if it turns out that there's a piece of it that they couldn't develop, you see over here, there was actually a stream and they were worried about that. So um, if it turns out they can't develop in there, that's okay. They just can't you know, replace acres in this red area with acres that are here in the uh, area that are marked off the, with the X's. Uh, oh, here's the other thing too, is that, right? These are houses down in here. So one of the things that we try to do is, you know, oftentimes you don't want to look at the solar farm, right? When, so when you go out to your back deck, you'd like to just be able to, to look at trees. So we try to put in visual barriers in the areas that, that people are concerned about. Right back here, there wasn't much there and there were woods over in there, the other areas. We didn't need visual barriers around the whole property, but um, we did want visual barriers around this portion of the property. And generally the developers are okay with that, putting in five or six foot trees uh, that will you know, over time grow and become those barriers. Uh, that, that's something that the developers are, are usually willing to do. So let's talk a little bit about the lease now. So let's see. So here's typical lease language, right? The lease gives the developer the right to build the project on the, on the leased area, including but not limited the right to construct solar panels, overhead and underground transmission lines, electric transformers and substations, energy storage facilities, telecommunications equipment and access roads as may be necessary for the purpose of carrying on the business of a solar power generation. I highlighted some of these because um, depending upon how these come, come together, right? these could be big deals. So for instance, what if you agree to this language, right? And you end up getting that on your property, right? That's a substation, right? Well, that's not what you bought in for, was it? Right? You didn't think that you were gonna have this, this massive substation on property, but that one word, substations in this paragraph gave them the right to put that in there. So you really need to be careful about that. And we address those in, in, in our leases. So, right, this on the other hand is, is the typical kind of substation that we expect to see on, on most projects, right? I don't have a problem with this, but I do have a problem with something like this. And this is something that falls into the category of an opportunity to make additional funds. So I have um, in one very large project, a client who will have something like this on his property. But that client is going to receive a yearly payment for the life of the lease, right? So if I'm excluding substations like this, utility sales substations from my lease, then if later on they want to put this on my property, that's when we start negotiating for what the payment is going to be for this. And I would tell you the payments for, for a substation like this could range from $10,000, $30,000 per year. Right? So this is significant. With that one word, we don't want to give away that much revenue in the lease. Right? Here's something else. Here's a battery storage station. I'm going to go back to here, right? Substations, energy storage facilities, right? Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Well, here's an energy storage facility. See that? These are what battery storage stations look like right now. And this is one of the keys to renewable energy development, right? They, they, that we lose a lot of energy in, in solar, right? So if we could store the energy, especially you know, holding on to that at night, then that would be very helpful. But this is the stage that we're at for battery storage. And these sort of battery storage uh, facilities are being put alongside renewable energy facilities throughout the state. Uh, they're being put along other substations to store energy. This uh, battery system supplies eight megawatts of power to the grid in upstate New York. Um, and there's future plans to expand it. But that's, the battery storage technology is, is, I think, improving, but it's still not great. It takes up a lot of space. So again, if you're going to have something like this on your property, you cannot give it away. In that language that I showed you, you gave it away. And I would say 95% of landowners are giving these things away. So you really need to make sure that this is being addressed and excluded. So. Now, how are we gonna deal with the rent, right? So first of all, the marketability of your property is really what is, uh, is key in terms of getting the best rent that you can get, what's your zone location and the utility that you're using. 
Generally, we're finding that uh, national grid uh, properties are paying a little bit more than NYSEG properties. And I think there's various reasons for that, but, but national grid tends to be a little bit easier to deal with, right? Are we dealing with the leased acres or usable acres? Right? So be careful of that. What does your lease say? Does it say that they're going to pay you on the full amount that's leased or just the point that they can use for, for the acres? You've got to make sure that you're looking at that. What about your escalation rate? Right? We're talking about 35 to 40 year leases. So whatever they pay me today, if there's no escalation rate in that, that rent payment, right, it's going to be devalued over time. So I have to have some provision that allows me to increase that rent over the next 35 to 40 years. I think um, there's a couple of different ways to do it, but, but for solar leases, we're seeing percentage escalation rates, right? 2% is the rate that, uh, that we probably see or like, like the most, but many of the developers are negotiating these issues um, to one, one and a half to one. I have one developer that, that will not give an escalation rate. Right? That developer will give a higher rent, but if you do the math over time, the, the landowner is just not making out uh, as, as well as landowners that start with a lower rent, but have an escalation rate. I also want, want to make sure that the rent is going to be paid through the restoration phase, right? So they terminate the lease, but the solar farm is still there and, and I don't have the use of my land until they finish the restoration. So I want to be paid right up until the time that everything is out. And that also, if I have that provision in the lease, motivates the company to get in and get everything taken care of. Um, then the other issue that we're seeing, is this gonna be a per acre rental or is it gonna be per megawatt, right? A lot of leases, for example, might be $1,200 per acre, right? That's pretty easy for us to figure out what, what you're receiving. But if it's on a per megawatt basis, right? That tends to be pretty complicated. And I've seen developers come in that come in with, with low numbers um, where the, the, the clients don't really understand it because there they're, are complicated um, formulas. It generally takes about six to seven acres to produce a megawatt of power. So if my, my lease rent is based upon the megawatts, right? And they wanna produce, let's say a five megawatt project, but how many acres is that gonna take? Well. If it's going to be per megawatts, it, what I, what, one of the things I want to do is limit the amount of land. I don't want it to give them unlimited land. So I want to fix that amount in, in the process, right? When I'm doing it per acre, I know how much land that I'm willing to lease. And I know what I'm going to be getting per acre. But on the megawatt, we, we don't necessarily get that. So be careful then. Um, now, here's another thing that controls some of the lease rates is that in New York, we have load zones. So here's the central zone, zone C, which is where I am, right? Our rates in zone C, our electric rates, are not as high as the rates that we're seeing in the capital area or in the uh, Hudson Valley area and closer, closer to New York City. So the location of your property, the zone that it's in, and the utility are all factors that, that uh, affect rates. Now, you know, the rates are all over the board right now, but like I said, you know, in zone C, we're probably seeing rates that are $1,000 an acre, 1,200, 1,500, maybe up to 2,000 in, in certain really unique situations. We're seeing higher rates that go in the capital district up to that 2,000 area, 3,000. And then, you know, when we're talking about real estate that has much higher value, then that has to be factored in too, in terms of what, what the rents are going to be. Let's see here. Um, so I lease my hundred acres, but then they have to figure out what they're going to use the property for, where it's gonna be. So the actual amount of property that ends up being my leased acres is gonna be determined later on when they figure out what they can use. And also then they'll do another survey. And then that survey, will be used to create that final site plan. And that's what the, um, the rent is gonna be based upon is those final leased acres. Um, I caution everyone to make sure that they are looking at title issues because I've had some things come up with uh, some of these projects that have uh, really caused major issues. Um, recently, I saw a property where it was um, 
we had a purchase agreement, right? It was an option and a purchase agreement, not a lease, but um, there was no pipeline on the property, but it turned out in the title, they, a company had the right to put in a natural gas pipeline, right? And it was a blanket easement, so it went over the entire property. When that was discovered in the title, right? It turned out now the property can't be developed. You can't put in a solar farm, and then later on find out that the, um, the natural gas company has the ability to come in and rip it all up and put in a pipeline. So we ended up in, a, in I think a protracted negotiation with the company where we were able to get them to move their pipeline to the boundary of the property. And, uh, and it worked out well for everyone. But I'll tell you, it added thousands and thousands of dollars to the project and, and it, it could have risked really canceling the whole thing. Um, so understand that, understand what your utility easements are. We see phone easements across properties on a regular basis. You can generally work with the telephone companies to, to get some of these things addressed, but you need to be looking at them. Hunting rights, I have one where there's a long um, lease for hunting on a property. Um, and uh, now the hunters had to be addressed before that project could move forward. And farm leases, we see them on a regular basis most of them are informal, some, some are more formal, but um, especially if you've made commitments on these farm leases, you need to be careful to, to make sure that you're honoring those commitments or working with, uh, with the, the person you've contracted with to, to take care of those issues when the development starts. They'll be able typically to farm until the company decides that they're ready to develop. Um, and at that point, what you hope to have are crop damage provisions in your lease that, that pays for any crops that are lost and you can take care of the person that way. Or maybe you'll just have a short notice provision that says that you know, they have to give you six months notice before development, and then that will terminate the farm lease. Um, so we talked a little bit about consent to all locations, right? Um, what about limiting our time to commence the construction? So they start the lease, right? And I've been getting paid, let's say for the option, maybe every year. Now they start the lease. When do they have to start the construction? Right? I want to limit the time to start construction because I don't want to commence the lease and then find out that the construction doesn't happen for another two or three years. The reason, by the way, is that you know you, most of these leases say that your rent does not start getting paid until they are generating power and selling it into the grid. So that is your goal. You want to get to that operation stage as soon as possible. I do have rent commencement dates that change in, in some leases. I have some that will say that it starts from the lease date. That's the best scenario. If I can get it from the, the date that they sign the lease, then that's great. And that's actually before they're selling the power into the grid. Um, if I can get it maybe at the commencement of construction, I can, I can do that. But more often than not, we're looking at uh, rent that starts at the, at the, um, the operation date. We need to make sure that we're addressing insurance. now. Earlier, we were talking about insurance on the option agreement, right? That policy didn't need to be as big because the, the things that they were doing on the property you know, were really not, not, not I think, as complex. Um, but now when we get into full-scale development for a solar farm, we really need to be looking at major insurance. And also, you need to be thinking about not just what acceptable insurance is for today, but what's it going to be for the next 35 to 40 years? Right. If I can get five or six thousand six million dollars of coverage over the life of a lease, that's where I want to be. Sometimes I'm getting that by having a million or two million underlying policy with an umbrella policy of three, four million dollars. So however that combination is, you want to make sure that you've got enough insurance into the future. You'll have an indemnification clause where the developer says they're going to indemnify you for, for any damages that happen. But you really need that insurance clause to make sure that it's backing up the indemnification clause. If it turns out that the company's not there, right? Maybe they don't have the assets anymore to develop or to, or to pay the, uh, the claim, then that's where the insurance is gonna come into play. Timber damages, right? If they're gonna take trees down, you wanna be paid for those trees. So we have, need to make sure we've got a timber provision. We're reserving oil and gas rights and timber, rock and gravel, same thing. And, and also not just Right? So for oil and gas, we can reserve our rights under the project, right? Obviously we can't drill on it, but I do wanna reserve my rights for the, the remainder of the property, making sure that we can do everything legally, legally allowed outside of the area that is leased. And I definitely wanna make sure that my ability to transfer the property and the mortgage the property 
is protected. They, that is never in any of the leases. So we really need to add that language in there to make sure that new lenders have the ability to come in and, and lease. Um, there's that with guests that I talked about, taxes, right? Also a major issue. So generally what's happening is that the solar company is coming in and they are paying the property taxes on their facilities, right? But you are paying the, the underlying land tax. So keep that in mind. They're, they're chargeable for the, the, the facility tax and all the personal property that's added, um, but you're still going to pay the taxes. We also need to make sure, though, that they are taking care of any penalties uh, for rollback or um, any violation of government programs, right? So what, what are we using the property for? If we have ag exemptions and we're losing that, and I saw that question earlier, does it affect the ag exemption? The answer is yes, it does. This is now a commercial project, right? So it's no longer consistent with an agricultural project, but you're going to lose that. So to the extent that you're losing that, they need to pay for, for that loss. Um, any programs that you might have like uh, conservation easements or 480A forest programs, right? They're going to have rollbacks associated with them when you change the use. So we need to make sure that the company is coming in and covering you for those additional expenses. And I also like to say, if there's any increase in the balance of my property that's attributable to the fact that now there's a solar farm on, on one por portion, that that increase is going to be covered too. Um, so look closely, right? What, what structures are on your property, crops, bluestone, make sure that uh, all of that is addressed if you need to. Um, this is that visual barrier that, that we were talking about. Right? These trees will grow up over time and uh, create a nice visual barrier. I do like to have all of my fencing lined in, um, in green material. I think that it just looks better. Um, and it also helps with that, that visual barrier. So let's, let's keep that in mind out there for, for some of our leases. And I don't get, ever get any pushback from the developers on these. Unless I came in and said, I want the entire solar farm to, to be lined like this and, and have these trees. Um, because look at what's back here behind the solar farm with the mountain. We really don't need to have that side with the visual barrier. There's already a natural visual barrier. But on this side, we want to make sure that that's there. Um, we're negotiating our easements. Oh, our transmission lines. To the extent that we can get them underground, we want to try to do that. Right Now, that's not always possible. But to, to the extent that we can get them underground, we'll try to do that. And um, I see a lot of developers put in there a right of first refusal. So if you want to sell the property in the future, then you need to go to them first to, and offer it to them. So let's, let's say that someone comes in and says, we're going to pay you $500,000 for your, for your property. The company has the ability to go in and now meet that offer and purchase the property for $500,000. I just like to get rid of those. I don't think that there's any reason to have them in there. And it becomes pretty difficult to enter into negotiations with third parties when they realize that despite all their efforts, the company can come in and, and take the property at the end. Um, vegetation control. Lauren mentioned the sheep. So um, that's a nice way to do it. And I'm seeing uh, that more and more. I don't see it a lot, but um, you know, it is possible to have vegetation controlled by sheep. The school that has the solar farm near me, they're trying to get sheep added to it because they would just love to have the kids out there and they want to try to, to work with, uh, with the sheep too, but we'll see how that goes. I definitely add in provisions in my leases that say that they shouldn't be using chemicals, you no know, herbicides, pesticides, biocides that are used on the property. I want to make sure that right, when this whole thing goes away and the property is restored, that I don't have the property damaged by, by hazardous materials. I will at times address invasive species. So, um, you know, I know you guys are all, all dealing with those issues. And uh, so maybe if we have an issue there, I'll put in a provision that says that the landowner and the company will work together to, to, to eliminate invasive species, species because that's something that, that's in all of our interests. Also, I've had landowners contract with the company or I put a provision in the lease that says that, that um, if they have to go out and hire someone to mow the lawn, that they should just come to us. I have somebody that's out there you know, maintaining all this property anyways. Hey, well, why don't they pay me? Why, why, why have to pay someone else? So the way we put it together is that the company has to come to, to the landowner first 
And uh, if they can come up with acceptable terms, then, then, then they will hire him. If not, then uh, they can go hire someone else. Um, uh, Scott, I'm just going to give you like a five minute warning because um, we okay. have a ton of questions that people are, are putting in the okay. chat. I think we I could be questions. here definitely all day. <laughs> <laughs> so decommissioning, right? Definitely key to make sure that your decommissioning provisions are, are there. Um, you know, they will oftentimes want to negotiate for less than full removal. So we always start with full removal of everything above grade and below grade. Um, but they'll come back and they'll say, well, how about if we re just remove everything down to 36 inches or 48 inches? And especially if you're farming the, the land, then those are going to be potential issues for you. Um, or they repair any damages, they restore it uh, to the condition that it was as the, as the effective date. That doesn't mean really regrading it and planting the trees, but planting vegetation and, and, and making, it, making it look good. The restoration bond is key because this is an area where everything that you've invested in and the return on your investment could go away if it turns out that you're stuck with those restoration costs. Um, I have people ask me all the time, you know, what's going to happen in 35 to 40 years? And none of us knows, right? What, what's the future of solar energy? For that matter, what's the future of energy? I tend to think that the future of energy has not yet been imagined yet. So when other forms of energy come up, what's going to happen to solar? If it turns out that solar is no longer the energy of the day, then this industry could just go away. Companies could go bankrupt. They, they decide not to, not to go out and, and honor their contracts. So you have to have a restoration bond in place to make sure you're doing these things, taking care of these costs. Um, there's always pushback from the companies on them. Not from the major companies, the major companies understand it, but a lot of them are giving us pushback on these bond provisions. And for me, if I don't get a decent bond provision, that might be a good reason to walk from the deal. Um, I don't like to do that. We really wanted to try to negotiate the best deal we can. But if I don't get good terms from a developer or, the, or my client doesn't have a good feeling about it, then you know what? We'll go out and find somebody else because right now there are so many developers that are out there that, that want to develop your property. Um, and also that bond needs to be updated every five years because a restoration cost that you calculate today is not going to be the same over time. Um, now, lease or sale. And this is it's getting towards my, my last slide, Liz, so we're close. But uh, this is often a question that, that we have. The company comes in and they give you an option. We'll lease your property or we'll sell your property. And um, my clients will then ask me, which one should I do? And my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I will just tell you, this is, a, this is a difficult issue because over time, if everything works as planned, right? Then there could be more money made. There will be more, more money made. And every single one of the deals where you lease, there, you'll make more money over time. Um, but will it go as planned? Right? Will the, the company continue to, to, to be in operation for the next 35 to 40 years? Will the future of energy stay the way that it is now? Right. Those are questions we don't know. So if you're uncertain about that and you're, you're hedging on it, then selling the property now for good price, investing that, those dollars um, now, maybe that's the way for you to go. But if you want to preserve this for your future generations, let them receive the benefit of the lease. You can, you can do that too. I had someone was convinced I wanted to do that, but they were getting such a high price for the, uh, for the sale of the property. I said, you know what? I know you, what you're thinking is you want the, your future generations to get these lease payments, but how about we just take these monies, invest them, and give that investment to your children into the future? And um, that was a deal that they ended up taking. Keep in mind, when they come to, to, to purchase your property, this is not a fair market value transaction at all, right? It might be three, four, five times or more of fair market value. Right? Fair market value is not the amount that you're talking about for a sale of your property. So just, just keep that in mind. Right? Property around me is selling for 1,500 an acre. They offer me two. Big deal. Right? That is just not enough money for you to, to sell the property on, on a solar deal. Um, and the money is there. Right? They, they will pay more than that. So you also want to make sure if you're signing this one of these purchase options that you're getting money up front, that you have a yearly option term payment that's coming to you, right? It's not uncommon to see five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars over the first year or two, or maybe, maybe after the title is cleared, additional dollars will come to you. 
we want to make sure that there's a minimum acres provision in the deal, right? I don't want to give them my 100 acre purchase option thinking they're going to buy the whole 100 acres and they end up just buying 20 acres of really what amounts to be the prime acreage on my property. I want to make sure that there's some control of that. If I can actually identify the property that's going to be purchased, that's the best. If I have to put in no development areas or areas that are off limit, I'll do that. But I also don't want them to come in and just, you know, carve up my property. I, I just saw a piece of property on an option agreement where they came in and they left these, these large spaces around the uh, boundaries of the property along the road. My client is now going to be paying taxes for useless property. So um, that just did not work. And that, that was not something that we were willing to do. So again, reserving all your rights during the option, making sure you're indemnified and insured, um, and uh, making sure that the company is paying all of the subdivision and, and any survey costs that are associated with it. So um, kind of final thoughts, you know, keep in mind, these are long-term transactions. You don't get the ability to renegotiate later. You need to make sure that you are getting this right now. This affects future generations. It can affect your surrounding property values and property values of others. So make sure you're, you're factoring that in. And um, I thought Lauren's advice on forming another company was really very good. You know, you're, now you're in kind of a, a commercial operation. So uh, think about forming a limited liability company for, um, for how you're gonna be holding the property. The timing of it, right? You might, you might be careful about that because forming a liability company means you might be losing other tax uh, benefits. But if it turns out the development is imminent, you really should be thinking about forming that LLC to move forward. And with that, I think that's it.